Mr. Shea, it's very dark down here. What if someone should discover us? Relax, everybody's up on deck for the evacuation party. Once the last of the equipment's aboard, the ship's ready to put out. How about you? What? Mr. Shea? Really? <laughs> Hira, come on, we're celebrating. Tonight we leave this place after all these months. Hell, I saw Norm Leaf and Lynn Paley up on deck. Even they were smiling. Well, they're being paid enough to vanish and forget their cares. You know, this movie has involved extraordinary secrecy. Yeah, and I know why. That geneticist guy, Furness, told me they'd used a human brain making that goddamn special effect. Hey, feel that? We're moving. That isn't all I can feel. Mm, hero meeting you makes up for everything. Hell, what's digging into my arm? Forget it, whatever it is. I can't wait until a hotel. Max, for God's sake. Max? You're so pale. What's wrong? Nothing, love. Nothing's wrong. Hold me. save the world. Lori, don't. Dan, trust me. I have to go. Beautiful, isn't it? <gasps> Forgive me, these things sometimes slip my mind. It won't happen again. Oh, that's comforting. Oh my god. I'm on Mars. This is where we hold our conversation. In it, you ask me to stop the imminent nuclear war. But why would I save a world I no longer have any stake in? And do it for me. If you really care. When you left me, I left Earth. Does that not show you that I care? My red world here, now, means more to me than your blue one. Let me show you. If you already know the future, then why were you surprised when I left you? Or when that reporter ambushed you? Why even argue about it if you already know how this is gonna end? I have no choice. Everything is preordained. Even my responses. And you're just going through the motions. The most powerful thing in the universe. Still just a puppet. So it's too much to ask for a miracle. Miracles, by their definition, are meaningless. Oh, God, John! Only what can happen does Just happen. stop! You're bullshit! Land this thing. Now! That's your wish. You know what? and send me back to Earth to fry with Dan and my mom and all the other worthless humans. But know that you were wrong. You said this ended with me in tears, and look, nothing. 
Maybe you were wrong about everything. You complain that I refuse to see life on life's terms. Yet you continuously refuse to see things from my perspective. You shut out what you're afraid of. I'm not afraid. You want me to see things your way? Go ahead. Show me. Do that thing you do. Over the past few years, in doing the work on our Secret Mysteries of America series, um, I get a lot of questions about early America. Sometimes people believe that what I'm saying is that I don't believe America has any kind of Christian history. And I always try to make it clear, as I did at the beginning of our presentation, that if we talk about Pilgrim America, I do believe that uh, that early America for the first 100 to 150 years was a Christian country, generally speaking, because I believe the Pilgrims and the Puritans were Christians. It's very clear from their own writings that they were. My contention, as I said before, is with American Revolutionary America and what the beliefs of the founders of the American Revolution were. Well, in that contention, I'm often asked, okay, well, what about David Barton? And David Barton, for those who don't know, is very well known in the Christian community for promoting the idea of America as a Christian nation. And one of his favorite tactics is to come out on stage with some old parchment looking paper and so on and tell his audience that he's using original source documents, which I agree can be useful if you quote them in their full context. He contends that the American revolutionaries were somehow or other trying to support or promote Christianity in the formation of the United States. Uh, and I believe, of course, that that is, uh, you know, provably wrong. It's a, it's a provably false argument based upon the available evidence. Uh, so in this section, what I want to do is talk about David Barton and talk about how he represents his information and how I really believe he manipulates historical but the only reason he doesn't do it with Obama and Pelosi is because Christians in our generation today, we know too much about these people. And hopefully what I've shown you in this presentation is that the Christian clergymen who were alive through the American Revolution did not believe that the revolutionaries were Christians. They believed generally that those men were infidels. Okay, so now what I want to do is I want to show you uh, a couple of examples from David Barton's website of founders and how he manipulates their quotes and so on. And he withholds the fact that these guys were not only not Christian, but they were actually antichrists. Let's take a look. All right. So now you go to David Barton's website or you read one of his books and you might find an image of John Adams. And out to the side, it says, the Christian religion is above all the religions that ever prevailed or existed in ancient or modern times. John Adams, signer of the Declaration, and so on. Okay? And now Christians go to Barton's website and they read his materials and they see a quote like that. And of course, David Barton is not going to tell them that uh, John Adams denied the reality of the Holy Ghost. David Barton is not going to tell them that uh, Adams blasphemed God and said that uh, the idea that Jesus is God manifest in the flesh is an awful blasphemy that needs to be got rid of. He's basically saying that we need to get rid of the gospel. He's saying the same thing Thomas Jefferson said. They both said we need to get rid of the gospel. And Thomas Paine said the same thing. You've got three founders who all three openly said in their declarations, we need to get rid of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And yet David Barton uh, doesn't even blush to present this guy in a church and make it look like and sound like that he was some kind of Christian. And you will also find Thomas Jefferson on Barton's website. And uh, one of the quotes that he has from Jefferson, uh, Jefferson says, I am a real Christian. That is to say, a disciple of the doctrines of Jesus Christ. I am a Christian in the only sense in which, in which he wished anyone to be. 
right? Thomas Jefferson and so on. Now, what Jefferson is saying in that quote, when he says, I am a real Christian, what he means, brethren, is he means you are not real Christians if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God. You're not a real Christian if you believe that he was born of a virgin and that he died on the cross for your sins and that God raised him from the dead and that by faith in him you have salvation and eternal life. Oh, you're not real Christians if you believe that. You're dupes. Uh, you're, you're, you're believing stupidity and falsehood and imposture, to use Jefferson's own words about the teachings of the gospel. And you're not a real Christian if you believe that. Jefferson's saying, I am a real Christian because I don't believe that stuff. I am a real Christian because I don't believe Jesus is the Son of God. That's what he's saying. And so as God says in the scripture, that even the offering of the wicked is abomination in his sight, so is this confession, a so-called confession from Thomas Jefferson. It's really an abomination. Because what he's doing is by that, he's mocking the gospel. And he's mocking those who believe the gospel. And it's shameful uh, that somebody like David Barton would present quotes from Thomas Jefferson like this and, and separate them from the full context of who Jefferson was. The view of Jefferson and John Adams was much like that of the ancient Jews that opposed Christ. When Jesus said to them, I and my Father are one, they took up stones to stone him. The scripture says, Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you from my Father. For which of those works do you stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, and because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. In the same way, Adams and Jefferson did not object to the good work that Jesus did, or to his example of morality. But concerning the doctrine that Jesus is God manifest in the flesh, as the Bible clearly teaches, at this they were incensed, and like the Pharisees of old, wanted him got rid of. They were very much like the Sadducees 2,000 years ago, who did not believe in miracles or angels or the supernatural. What I want to do next is to go over this book by David Barton, which is called The Question of Freemasonry and the Founding Fathers. And uh, in this book, what David Barton attempts to do is he attempts to argue that Freemasonry had no real influence in the founding of the United States of America. And I'm going to show you why we strongly disagree with him. Uh, not only that, but he also attempts to argue that original American masonry, the masonry of George Washington and the other founders, was somehow or other a Christian organization. That it was originally a Christian organization that went bad later on. And I'm going to show you why I disagree with that view as well. And I'm also going to show you that the, the Masonic philosophies that David Barton himself acknowledges in this book are the same philosophies that were held by the founding fathers of the United States. And they're the very philosophies that we've been going over uh, in this presentation. So let's get started. Perhaps most significant is that Barton begins his question of Freemasonry by making an appeal to the Christian perspective. Right here at the beginning in the front of this book, he says this question will be examined from a Christian perspective illuminating not only historical occurrences, but also biblical considerations. Now, I contend against David Barton that that statement is false. He does not consider this from a Christian perspective or from a bibl with biblical considerations. The reason I contend against David Barton on that issue is I don't believe he really is examining these things, the founders, from a Christian perspective. And he's certainly not judging according to the Bible. And the chief reason that I say that is that David Barton 
uh, leads tours throughout Washington, D.C., trying to convince people that the architecture and the design there is somehow or other evidence of our godly uh, heritage or godly Christian heritage, we would assume. And, and yet the architecture is surrounded with all of these pagan statues of gods and goddesses throughout the ancient world that the Bible calls demons. The Bible says very clearly uh, that you know Neptune and Apollo and Athena and Hermes and so on, all of these gods that are there in Washington, D.C., the Bible says they're demons. In the Bible, we read about how the early church in Corinth got involved with the various temple practices of ancient Greece. Those who were Christians were joining themselves to those who still worshipped the gods and goddesses of the pagan world. As a result, the Apostle Paul wrote and warned them, saying, I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God, and I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and the table of devils. And when Paul is writing that, he's writing to the Corinthians, who were Greeks. The Corinthians had, they, they worshipped, uh, the, the unbelieving Corinthians, worshipped all of those gods and goddesses, those Greek uh, and sometimes Roman gods and goddesses that we find in Washington, D.C. The Bible says they're demons. But David Barton says, no, don't be concerned about that. They're just part of classical literature that the founding fathers were educated in. He says the choice of those symbols by the framers does not indicate any type of paganism on their part. Barton argues that the reason many modern Christians reject pagan symbols in Washington, D.C. is because Americans in recent generations have not been trained in classical literature a training that was routine in the founding era, he says. Yet, even 200 years earlier, the danger of so-called classical studies was defined by the 16th century scholar Erasmus, who said that under the cloak of reviving ancient literature, paganism tries to rear its head, as there are those among Christians who acknowledge Christ only in name, but inwardly breathe heathenism. Now, we've already seen from the writings of uh, uh, the founders like uh, Ben Franklin and uh, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson that these guys are not Christians. And so they're talking about God and they're involved either with Freemasonry or they are into, like John Adams. Adams is very clearly making reference to uh, pagan writings uh, to formulate his ideas about God. Uh, John Adams is, is preferring the description of God in some Indian ancient book, the Shasta, above anything he ever read in the Bible. And he's calling the Bible blasphemy because it doesn't agree with his uh, pagan view of God, of who God is. He's saying that Americans in recent generations have not been trained in classical literature, a training that was routine in the founding era. Therefore, present-day Americans are not inclined to consider structures from the ancient empires, etc., and so on, or to be familiar with their heroes, such as Cato, Cicero, and Aeneas, or even with their writers, such as Homer, Virgil, Herodotus, and especially Plutarch. And he goes on. Homer and Virgil, let's just take Homer. A lot of people know Homer from the writing of uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey. Okay. Uh, what's Homer writing about? Homer's writing about Odysseus, or Ulysses, going on his journeys and encountering all the various gods and goddesses of the ancient world. That's what he's writing about. All of those gods that are being talked about, the Bible calls demons. The Bible says these are demonic powers and principalities. And the same is true of all these other writers. In fact, uh, the, the goat of Mendes in the 19th century that was developed with the Baphomet by Eliphas Levi, Eliphas Levi developed his philosophies about that 
through the writings of Herodotus, who's writing about the, the pagan mysteries of the ancient world and, and how the, uh, the Greeks and the Romans were interacting with the Egyptians and so on. Now, if David Barton was judging this from a biblical perspective, then he would acknowledge that these various gods and goddesses are called demons, according to the Bible. All right, now here's the incredible statement from David Barton, right here. All right, notice what he says. It is historically and irrefutably demonstrable that Freemasonry was not a significant influence in the formation of the United States. Um, I think that the most, there's a lot of evidence that we could present to prove that he's wrong about that. I think the clearest and the most decisive is the declaration that we have from Congress in 2007. In the 110th Congress, when Nancy Pelosi became Speaker of the House, that Congress put forth House Resolution 33 in honor of the Freemasons of America. And here's what it said. The resolution recognized the thousands of Freemasons in every state in the nation. It said specifically, whereas the founding fathers of this great nation and signers of the Constitution, most of whom were Freemasons. Furthermore, the resolution was put forth by former congressman and 33rd degree Freemason Paul Gilmore. Most of the founders and most of the signers of the U.S. Constitution. Now that's not from some conspiracy writing. That's the U.S. Congress. That's the congressional record. All right, so now David Barton recognizes, let's look over here. All right, in his book, David Barton acknowledges what Freemasonry is. Notice what he says. He says, finally, Masonry includes a very religious component that is highly universalist and deistic. The God recognized by Masonry is whatever God any individual Mason might recognize whether the Judeo-Christian God or a pagan or pantheistic God. To avoid religious controversy, all deities are recognized in masonry by a single deistic name, Gautu, the great architect of the universe. Okay, now he says that. He acknowledges that that's the Masonic view. Then you move forward, and he's giving his, his history of Freemasonry that largely he does not understand. Uh... But let's look at, he follows up with that now, and he, draw, he does a comparison now here between masonry and Christianity. And he says that according to masonry, Jesus of Nazareth was but a man like us, or his history, but the unreal revival of an older legend. Because uh, a lot of the thinking in Masonry is that Jesus is just like a, a latter-day version of Mithras or, or Horus or, or, or whatever. But this is exactly what the founders believed. This is exactly what Jefferson and Adams believed. It doesn't matter if Jefferson or Adams were themselves Freemasons in the sense that they were literally a member of a Masonic Lodge somewhere. That doesn't matter. They believed in the same philosophy that masonry does. They believe that Jesus of Nazareth was just a man like anybody else. They rejected the idea that he was God manifest in the flesh. Uh, think about what Jefferson says when he, he says that the, uh, the day will come when the story of Jesus born of a virgin will be classed with the fable of Minerva, an older legend. That's exactly what Thomas Jefferson believed. And it's what Benjamin Franklin believed. And it's what John Adams believed. And it, again, it doesn't matter if they were literally members of Masonry or not. And he goes on to give a quote here from Albert Mackey that the true Mason realizes with the divine illumination of his lodge that as a Mason, his religion must be universal. Christ, Buddha, or Muhammad the name means little. And then he goes on. Why did George Washington go into battle? 
According to Washington's own statement, George Washington took the field. He went to war and fought the American Revolution, not for Christianity, but so that Christians and Jews and Muslims and any other religion could be practiced on American soil. George Washington went to war and he fought for the God of Masonry and for the Masonic version of religion. That's what he fought for. Um, No, it is not of God to teach people that they have the right to bow down and worship whatever God they want to worship. God would not send a Christian man onto the field of battle to fight for, for the principle of allowing people to worship demons. I know of nothing in the Bible where, where God says, yes, go into all the world and make sure that people have the right to worship. completely avoids the fact that the God of George Washington, by Washington's own admission, was the great architect of the universe. So what is he saying? He's actually saying that the God of George Washington is not the God of Christianity. Because George Washington repeatedly in his letters made reference to the great architect of the universe. In fact, here I'll show you, uh, these are some of the letters of George Washington that you can go online and uh, look at on the Library of Congress website. And you can actually see Washington's own letters written in his own hand where he makes reference to the great architect of the universe several times. He refers to the grand architect of the universe and even the supreme architect of the universe. These are all in letters that Washington wrote to the Masonic lodges. If you read those letters, I believe it's very clear that George Washington was a lot more comfortable writing to his fellow Masons. He felt uh, much more of a, of a kinship with them than he ever seemed to with the Christians, with the pastors and so on, that he would write to in his correspondence. It's my observation, reading his letters, I would encourage others to read his letters and draw your own conclusion. To his brothers of the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania, Washington wrote, Permit me to reciprocate your prayers and to supplicate that we may all meet hereafter in that eternal temple whose builder is the great architect of the universe. He's very comfortable with the great architect of the universe. But what David Barton is saying, the the problem is he just does not make the connection in his book that George Washington worshipped the great architect of the universe. And yet he's saying without realizing it that the God of George Washington is not the God of Christianity. That's what he's saying. But he just doesn't put the pieces of the puzzle together in the way that he should. So then he goes down a list of people here, and he's, he's trying to argue about who was and who was not a Freemason. And here, this is probably the biggest part, the thing that's very, very important to discuss and talk about. Notice what he says. He says, period two. He's talking about the different periods, and he's saying original American Masonry, okay, through the American Revolution, until approximately 1813, American Masonry was an organization that not only adhered to, but even required Orthodox Christian doctrinal teachings as part of its practice. Now, obviously, we know that's not true, because uh, Benjamin Franklin was a very famous Freemason. Again, he was master of the lodge in Philadelphia. It was said he only missed like five lodge meetings in his whole lifetime, but he most definitely did not believe Orthodox, Christian, doctrinal, anything. He didn't believe that stuff. He stated it, and he was well known for that. You know, uh, Franklin was, he, he didn't adhere to those doctrines or those beliefs. And yet he was a very famous Mason, very prominent and very, very influential in Freemasonry. Uh, so right there off the bat, probably one of the most famous Masons of all time, Benjamin Franklin, uh, stands contrary to what Uh, David Barton is saying. What he's trying to do is he's trying to say that American Masonry was originally Christian and it only became this kind of esoteric occult organization after the American Revolution, after guys like George Washington were gone. That's what he's trying to do. Uh, But what he's saying is provably false. Barton argues that American Masonry only embraced paganism in the 19th century. 
He writes that the two individuals most influential were Albert Mackey and Albert Pike. Their writings, filled with beliefs and practices openly heretical to Christianity, breathed a new life and spirit into American Freemasonry, a new and pagan philosophy by Mackey and Pike. So part of continuing his idea that Freemasonry became corrupt only after the American Revolution, he introduces Albert Pike and Albert Mackey as two of these agents of corruption. Uh, the reality is that what happened was that after the, the American Revolution, occultism was legalized in America and throughout Europe because of the American Revolution, and then you had the French Revolution, and then all of these revolutions are happening across Europe. And what happened was, once uh, uh, Christianity was essentially cast down, and no longer were uh, governments being judged in Europe and America according to the teachings of the Bible, the doctrine of religious liberty so-called, what that did was it legalized the worship of idols. It legalized witchcraft and demonology and all of this stuff. And so what happened was the people, what, what, what Albert Pike is doing and Eliphas Levi and Albert Mackey and others, they're not inventing new ideas about what you know, these secret societies were all about. Not at all. What they're doing is they're now publishing openly, because it's legal, they are publishing openly what they had been practicing in private, secretly, for centuries. They didn't just spring up out of nowhere. They had always been part of the inner doctrines of Freemasonry and all of these secret groups. But what happened was, as a result of the American Revolution and the other revolutions in Europe, religious liberty legalized demonology. There's no other way to say it. It became legal, so they had nothing to fear in writing and publishing these books and getting this information out there. Uh, after Mackey, and uh, I mean, you, you first have Eliphas Levi, then Albert Pike, Albert Mackey, then you get Madame Blavatsky, uh, uh, Lester Crowley, and then Manley Hall in, into the 20th century. They were all uh, a whole stream of spiritual licentiousness that had been uh, engineered by the founding fathers of America. They're the ones who, who originally gave license to devil worship. In the 20th century, Manley P. Hall would become known as Masonry's greatest philosopher, a title given to him by his fellow Freemasons. Hall wrote extensively about pagan philosophies and especially about the founding of America. In his book, The Secret Destiny of America, he describes what may be the real reason the Founding Fathers concealed their true beliefs and outwardly presented themselves as Christians. He says, The rise of the Christian Church broke up the intellectual pattern of the classical pagan world. By persecution, it drove the secret societies into greater secrecy. The pagan intellectuals then reclothed their original ideas in a garment of Christian phraseology, but bestowed the keys of the symbolism only upon those duly initiated and bound to secrecy by their vows. According to Hall, these pagan intellectuals intentionally deceived those around them. While professing things that sounded Christian outwardly, they inwardly breathed heathenism which is the fulfillment of certain biblical warnings. Jesus said, Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. He had also said to the Pharisees, Ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so, ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? You know, some might think that God has changed his position on the idea of religious freedom. You know, they might, they, they might think, well, 
you know, for this time, you know, God uh, wants us to have this religious freedom, et cetera, and so on. Uh, but but that's not th- that's just not the case biblically. I mean, if if we look at the scriptures and we see what's happening in the book of Revelation, God is pouring out plagues and disasters and so on. He's pouring out judgments upon the earth. And when he does, it says, and still the people would not repent of their worship of idols. That mankind still refused to repent. You see, the gospel is not God's suggestion. It's not God's recommendation for mankind. Uh, That's why Paul, when Paul stood on Mars Hill and he preached to the Athenians, he looked out at all of their gods and then he told them, you know, that they had a misunderstanding about who God is. And so uh, he says, the times of this ignorance God winked at in times past, but now he commands that all men everywhere repent because he's appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained. And he's given assurance unto all men in that he has raised him from the dead, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the commandment of God. This is why John writes in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 23, he says, and this is his commandment, that we believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ. This is a commandment from God. The problem with the doctrine of religious freedom, as it's set forth in the Constitution, is that it's being called a God-given, inalienable right. That our Creator, God, has endowed us with this right to worship whatever God we please, or to worship God uh, in whatever way we want. That's not at all what the Bible says. Now, it would be one thing... If, uh, if our government alone were guilty of this uh, false doctrine. But it goes beyond that because the church has now been roped in and we've got pastors and teachers and leaders that are going around telling everybody, this is your God-given inalienable right that, you know, to, to believe whatever you want to about God. And then it seems like a complete contradiction to come back and tell them, well, wait a minute, you've got to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ or you can't be saved. The Bible doesn't promote freedom of thought. The Bible says that we're called to bring every thought captive into the obedience of Christ. If we were founded as a Christian nation, that would be the admonition. It would be just like the declaration of Harvard University that every student shall earnestly consider that the main end of his life and studies is to know God and Jesus Christ, for this is eternal life. Uh, That would be what our Constitution and our Declaration and so on would have been about that doctrine, Uh, not necessarily forcing people into, you know, some kind of a thought life, but that being the focus and the purpose of America. In the Scriptures, we are told to consider the faith of those who have come before us. The book of Hebrews says, concerning the saints of old, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country, And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God. For he hath prepared for them a city. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. Time to say. Not long enough in my book, Eddie. Get in the car. Now. Are there no depths you won't sink to? Jesus Christ, Sally. And a guy I talked to his you know, old friend's daughter. Drive. It was a mistake. One time. Guy tries to rape you. 
years later you let him finish the job? What? Were you drunk or just lonely? Am I ever gonna live this down? It's a joke. Uh, yeah, well, I'm sorry if I don't trust your sense of humor. Will you smile? If I admit I was wrong. Lots of occurring, like oxygen turning into gold. I've longed to witness such an event, and yet I neglect that in human coupling. Millions upon millions of cells compete to create life for generation after generation until finally your mother loves a man, Edward Blake, the comedian, the man. She has every reason to hate, and out of that contradiction against unfathomable odds, it's you. Only you that emerged to distill so specific a form from all that chaos. It's like turning air into gold. A miracle. If me, my birth, if that's a thermodynamic miracle, I mean, you could say that about anybody in the world. Yes, anybody in the world. But the world is so full of people, so crowded with these miracles that they become commonplace. And we forget. I forget. We gaze continually at the world and it grows dull in our perceptions. Yet seen from another's vantage point, as if new, it may still take the breath away. Come, dry your eyes, for you are life, rarer than a quark, and unpredictable beyond the dreams of Heisenberg, the clay in which the forces that shape all things leave their fingerprints most clearly. Dry your eyes, and let's go home. Rorschach, I think we're in bad trouble. The person behind this, the person we're up against, I think it's Adrian. All this Egyptian stuff. I thought I'd check out pyramid deliveries on his computer. As password, I tried Ramesses II, the Egyptian name for Ozymandias. He runs it, Rorschach. Runs pyramid deliveries, dimensional developments, the whole show. But... Vite was target. I know it's crazy, and I don't want to believe it, but perhaps we should find Adrian fast. Karnak. Ramesses built a gigantic hall there, a monument. Karnak must be Vite's Antarctic retreat. Better grab those papers from his desk. It's a long journey, and they'll make better reading than the life jacket instructions. Everything's all right. 